Bevel ripping is one of those cuts which officially you can't do on the Triton work centre because you can't angle the saw blade significantly in the table saw mode. There are a number of ways around it, and I'll show you them in a moment, but before doing so, you should always consider when contemplating a bevel cut, can it be done in the cross-cut mode? As you know, as you saw earlier, you can get between 450 mil to 600 mil of capacity, 18 inches to 24 inches wide, and most bevel cuts indeed are on a board of that width. If you have to do a longer piece, then here are some of the methods you can consider. Firstly, if you're doing a shallow angle, for example, for the top of a skirting board or for a window sill for a rain drip off groove, then what you can do with a shallow angle is attach a batten to the board you want to cut. Now this batten has got to be flush all the way along. In this case, I've nailed it on, but if you're worried about the nails marking the main piece of wood, uh, you can use two-sided tape, double-sided carpet tape, and that'll stick the batten on quite firmly. And then, very simply, all you're doing, you're still running it through parallel, but you're angling the wood to the blade. And just hold it firmly against the fence like this, and do the cut. One of the more common angles you may need to bevel rip is 45 degrees. Firstly, this one, you'll have to obtain a length of right-angled aluminium, say 40 by 40 by 3, generally fairly commonly available. Rebate that into a board, have that board angled uh, to another board and use hinges so you can get different settings that you need, like 30 degrees, 22 and a half degrees, 45 degrees. And then clamp or bolt this main carrier board to the Triton table. So at the edge of your saw blade, this edge is exactly in line with the V of the groove. Then you can fit the riving knife in the safety guard, take your piece of wood, put it in the V like so, prepare a push stick for finishing off, and do the cut. It's also a very good means of making your own quad if you need to. Uh, the load on the saw is very high with this sort of cut, so adjust your feed rate accordingly, don't overload your saw, and make sure you've got a sharp blade. Let's say you want to panel a door and you need to make a number of pieces like this. Well, okay, you could do the long faces in a bevel ripping jig like this one, but when you come to the short ends, how do you do that? Two ways. You can do it in the cross-cut mode, of course, holding the wood down flat and angling the saw blade and running the saw blade through. Or you can still do it in this mode, but if you were to do it like this, you'd start off okay resting in the bottom of your V, but then when you got alongside the blade doing the cutting, you'd be jamming against the side of the blade, and that will ruin your cut and could cause an accident. So don't do that. If this is a jig you're building, make sure that this edge here is exactly parallel to the V-groove in the aluminium channel. And then you can clamp a straight piece of scrap onto the piece of work, work you'll be using, the piece of wood you'll be using, and rest the scrap on this top edge. Then you're not relying on the V for support, and you can make the cut very simply. You'll see in the router section how you can use a 45 degree router cutter to achieve the same result. You can use your work centre for faceplate sanding if you replace your saw blade with a sanding disc. Now you can make your own sanding disc with some limitations. You can obtain at most hardware stores a stone or metal cutting disc and glue sandpaper to both sides, coarse on one side, fine on the other. A word of warning, don't use contact adhesive because you will have to peel that sandpaper off when it becomes clogged or torn.
and if you've glued it down hard, you won't get it off easily. So use some disc cement. But the limitation with making your own homemade disc is that they tend to flex a little bit, and you can get off square when you, if you push the wood a little hard. You can obtain through us or through your Triton stockist a properly fabricated aluminium disc that is available in range of sizes from 7 inch to 9 inch and has excellent peel and stick sandpaper pads which can be peeled off when they become worn and fresh ones put on and they stick beautifully and they're available in coarse and fine grades as well. Here's how it works but small word of caution the dust created in sanding is very fine dust, so you should really protect yourself, protect your breathing by having a simple dust mask. If you haven't got a dust mask, you can just tie a handkerchief around your face. If you've, got a, if you've got a lot of repetition sanding to do, this is the only way to do it. Incidentally, you can use some mitre gauge of the work center to clean up end grain, like this. Just park the mitre gauge in the right spot and move the wood in gently. You can cut tiles very accurately and easily on your Triton work center. You can do it in the table saw mode or the cross cut mode. In the table saw mode, uh, protect your tabletop from being scratched by having a mask of hardboard or plywood with the tip of the masonry disc just showing above the, the, the mask. Then you can set your fence in position and run your tile through on its face. In this instance, when cutting tiles, you've got tiny little chips of ceramic material wear proper eye protection, wrap around safety glasses and also a dust mask because the dust could be a problem. So get a proper dust mask. Now you're ready to go. You may have to experiment a little and break a few tiles uh, before you get the appropriate blade setting and the feed rate for the particular tiles you're cutting. But play around with it. You might want to do two passes or do one pass with the tile face down then turn it end for end and do another pass with the tile face up. And that way your two grooves will be directly opposite each other and the tile will break more easily. When you're dealing with quarry tiles or floor tiles generally, or with slate tiles, then you'll probably find that it's better to cut them in the cross-cut mode. When cutting tiles in the cross-cut mode, you don't try to cut through the tile in one pass. You do it in a number of passes, lowering the disc on from above. Now for this, you'll need a saw that's got a fairly secure rise and fall mechanism. The uh, vertical lift saws discussed in the plunge cutting section may not be suitable for this operation. Make sure you've got a smooth slide because you will be sliding your saw backwards and forwards and there is a lot of dust created and it's quite abrasive. So lubricate your channels before they're doing the cut and clean them out after you've finished tile cutting for the day. Put some packing on your work table so that you don't scratch the paintwork. And uh, of course, dust mask and safety glasses are necessary. This cut will create a lot of dust. You may not be able to see what I'm doing but you'll see the concept at least. Loosen the blade angle adjuster, do a dummy run, make sure everything's okay, switch on the power, and then gently lower the disc onto, onto tile and let the weight of the saw do the cutting basically while you move it backwards and forwards. Don't press down hard. <laughs> 
and that's cut through right quite cleanly. If you take a bit of care and are reasonably patient, you can even cut bricks on your Triton using the method I've just shown in the cross-cut mode. A couple of precautions, protect your tabletop from scratching and make sure the bearing channels are as clean as possible before and during the cutting. Try to keep the brick dust out of the channels as much as you can. Cutting thin gauge metal is also very simple on the Triton by fitting a metal disc to your saw instead of your saw blade. And incidentally, if you want to cut aluminium, then use a tungsten carbide tip blade. But for steel, use a friction disc, protect your tabletop again, and preferably G-clamp the, the material in position to the tabletop. Uh, now you can either drop the saw onto the work like this, or if your saw doesn't have a very secure rise and fall mechanism, then you can have the saw disc at full depth and just cut through as if you're cutting through a piece of wood, but take it very slowly. And if you're doing it in the latter method, you must clamp the work down to the table. It's as simple as this. That's given a nice square cut, slight blur which can be filed off but very fast. When using the jigsaw in conjunction with your Triton work centre, you use it upside down with the router and jigsaw tabletop. Under certain circumstances when you're doing straight line work, you can use a fence and you can even use a safety guard for certain cuts to give you some measure of protection. But seeing as the jigsaw is mostly used for cutting intricate curves and shapes, you basically have to follow a line and not use a fence or guard. So that means you have to be super careful about where you put your hands. Don't be blasé about a jigsaw. They can hurt just as easily as a circular saw. Keep your hands well clear of the blade. Try to support both sides of the workpiece and try to feed your work smoothly. Now, it's not often possible to follow a, follow a pencil line exactly. You may have to decide to call one side your waste piece and concentrate on keeping the other side intact which might mean taking some uh, cuts from, uh, some wider cuts and then cleaning it off as you go around. Basically the action is like this. And that's given me a perfect piece that I can just clean up there a little bit and there a little, and it'll be fine. Now, when jigsawing, especially in thick materials, it's very easy to flex the blade sideways. It doesn't take much, much twist on the workpiece to bend the blade over, and of course that will lose your nice square edge. So take it very easy on sharp curves, and if necessary, as I said, cut into the other piece and make several approaches to a curve so that you can get it just right. Now a quick look at some of the fitting difficulties you may come across in fitting your router. Be guided by the instruction sheet that came with the router and jigsaw table, but here are a few of them. Firstly, if your router has a very shallow base and it prevents the top clamp from doing its job properly, very simply cut yourself some pieces out of hardboard or plywood and glue them onto the router base beneath the top clamps so it gives you a bit of extra height for the top clamp to bear down against, like so. This particular router has an inclined base, and that's quite common these days. So what you have to do there is remove the top clamps, put them in your vise, and bend that leg forward, angling it so it bears down squarely on the inclined face, like so. Now this router has another problem too. The locking mechanism for the height adjustment would foul a normal clamp if the normal clamp was in there. So what we've done is dispensed with the top clamp altogether and bent over the bottom clamp 
so it's acting as a hook down clamp and that gives you clearance for your locking cam. This particular router here has a large D handle and it will fit on the plate but only if you angle it diagonally across the plate with a power cord coming out over this corner. Another interesting point about this router is that it comes with four holes in the router base. So I'm not using the router clamps at all that are provided with the, with the table. I've bolted it directly to the plate using the holes in the router base and I've used flat washers and spring washers and hex nuts rather than wing nuts. It's very important to keep your router cutters in good shape. Uh, keep them clean, keep all the resin off and don't let them just rattle around in the bottom of a drawer because they will clash against each other and you will lose your nice sharp edge. Preferably make up a little stand like this with a few holes in it that you can plug your router bits in and leave them where they won't be touching each other. Keep them clean. If you see this cutter, it's completely gummed up. It's full of resin and burnt pieces of wood. Keep them clean and uh, also you can wash the faces of the cutting flutes with mineral turpentine and with steel wool perhaps on the end of a, uh, end of a pointer to clean them up. But a dull, uh, gummed up cutter like that won't cut properly. When fitting and removing your router bits, firstly always switch off the power. Secondly, make sure that the router shank is quite clean and don't handle a shank with your fingers because they will rust from the sweat on your fingers push it all the way into the router chuck and firmly tighten. It is not a good idea at all to partially withdraw a router bit from the router chuck. You'll damage both the bit and the chuck and could have a, uh, a router bit flying around the workshop if you partially withdraw it. Lock it off firmly and try to make sure your spanners don't skid and fall off the, the nuts as you're tightening them because you can actually break a router cutter fairly simply, fairly easily if the spanner slips. A final point, if using a shank reducing collet, uh, line up the split in the collet with the split in the router chuck, and that way it'll tighten securely. As you no doubt know, you can use your router right way up or upside down in the Triton in much the same way as you use your power saw. When do you use each of the two modes? Well, basically, you use the overhead router mode when you're building shelving, cupboards, uh, built-in wall units where you might be cross-trenching long, wide and heavy pieces of material which it's obviously inconvenient to move over a stationary router. It's better to lay the wood down flat and move the router over the top. When using the router in this mode you'll almost certainly find that the table is too low for the router cutter to reach. Don't raise the table, rather put some packing under the piece that you're going to be routing. The packing does two things. Firstly, it, it offers the workpiece up to the router cutter, and secondly, it'll prevent you from cutting through the notched workstop. This cutout in the workstop is to allow the router cutter to pass through, and uh, so you need packing, which at least gets you to this point on the workstop. Then you can put your board in position, and you'll have to hold it very firmly, or preferably clamp it. So let's just put a clamp on now. The need for the clamp will be obvious the first time you use the router because you'll find there's a tremendous tendency for the wood to move sideways. The router cutter will want to move the wood. So clamp it down or have sandpaper lined fences. More on that in a few moments. Because you're not cutting all the way through the workpiece but just doing a trench, then you want that trench to be the same depth all the way along. Before doing a cut, double check that your Triton table is set accurately and in the same plane as the traverse of the router. How do you do that? Very simply, lower the router cutter onto the board till it's touching, and then push it across the board with the power switched off. And it should scrape evenly all the way along. If it doesn't, you might have to raise or lower your Triton table at one end very slightly. Once you've got your true setting position, you can then perhaps use the depth stop on your router, or just eyeball it and go down the amount you want to trench. Lock it off firmly, and then you're ready to cut. Safety glasses again, and try to help your G-clamp by holding the wood fairly firmly and do the cut. On this first one, I'll go all the way through, then I'll show you some stop trenches.
if you're doing a deep trench, don't try to do it too ambitiously. Don't try to do it in one pass. Do it in two or three. Go down a little bit more. Don't move the wood and do another cut. If you're working with real wood rather than particle board, you may find uh, that you get some substantial breakout where the router cutter leaves the workpiece. There's a way of rectifying that, and that is to insert, backing up the workpiece, a straight piece of wood which you can screw to your work stops. You must screw this on, but then that'll, like, that'll give you good backup support at the point where the router cutter breaks out and you'll minimize the splintering. If you're working with particle board that has a hardwood strip on the edge of it, or if for some other reason you don't want your trench to go all the way through, then very simply all you do is fit a stop block, clamp a stop block onto your aluminium bearing channels to stop the travel of your router plate. It's as simple as this. If you have a plunge router, you can set up two stop blocks, one in that position and one further back here, so you can control both ends of the trench and you can have a double blind entry trench or an elongated mortise. That's the way you do staircase stringers. More on that in a few moments. If you're working with particle board which is bowed, like this piece, of course that will change the depth of your trench from one end to the other. There's a good way of rectifying it. Get one or two carpenter's clamps like this, preferably look for ones with a shallow head, and you may have to file off a protrusion on the bottom so that you can separate the two parts of the clamp. Then you can place this part of the clamp through the centre slot in the table, and the rest of it up from underneath, and lock it in position and flatten out your bow in the sheet. And you'll find that if that goes through the centre slot in the table, the router cutter will quite clearly miss it, because the cutter passes through about this point here, and you can even use two of these, one from this side and one from that side. This next router setup illustrates a couple of important points. I'm set up to do staircase stringers, for example. Now you'll be working with long heavy pieces, so make sure you've got good outboard support. Either use a Triton extension table or a trestle or two. Use the Triton protractor, the mitre gauge, to set your angle. But don't try resting a long heavy piece against the mitre gauge. It's not quite long enough to give you good support. So use it to set the angle of a piece of scrap which you clamp firmly to the table. Before you put your stringer in, make a, br a little notch in your scrap. That's your sighting point. You'll find that sighting up is quite difficult with a router, and this will help you in immensely. Because a staircase stringer requires stop trenches, you shouldn't go all the way through. You'll need a stop block there, a stop block here, and of course clamp your work down. Even though it's a heavy piece, it still needs to be clamped down to the Triton table but then a staircase stringer can be made as easily as this. Clamp it back up, line up this edge with the line, and then do your second cut. This method can, of course, be used for making smaller work like louvers or anything where you need to route a trench uh, on the incline. Because of the sighting difficulties you'll encounter in using a router, we strongly recommend that you make up a permanent routing platform. Now, do you remember the bevel cross-cutting platform we made earlier? Well, th that doubles excellently for routing because it gives you the packing support. It gives you a higher fence to rest your work against. I've got sandpaper on the fence to stop uh, the material from creeping and minimise the need for clamping, and a notch at this point will enable me to sight up router cuts perfectly every time. The direction of rotation of the router cutter is critical, especially when using the router upside down in the shaper mode, but even in the overhead router mode it should be considered. Very simply put, the router, uh, when viewed from above, travels in a clockwise direction. Now, if you're trying to creep up the right-hand line with a router going in a clockwise direction and you've got a small amount to remove 
to come up to that right hand line, then there's a real danger that the router cutter will climb up on the work, try to bite off more than it can chew, and end up by giving you a ragged cut or by forcing the, the material sideways. So it's always best if you can, if you're doing a trench which is wider than the cutter will do in one pass, to start off on the right hand line, right on it, and then move your way across to the left hand line. Very simply like this, you line up your pencil mark with the edge of your notch, and then make your first cut. <laughs> Just a couple of quick points about that sighting notch. Firstly, if you change router cutters, let's say you put a narrower diameter cutter in, then of course the notch won't be quite as effective. You'll have to make a new fence. Uh, and secondly, it doesn't really matter operationally which way around you put your router in, that way or this way. But unless you've got your router mounted spot on, dead center on this plate, then it will make a difference to your notch. So always put your router in the same way, just in case you're slightly off center and you won't damage that notch or recut that notch on your first pass. All of the cuts I've done so far with the router have been in particle board, which is fairly free cutting. Cutting hardwood is a little more difficult. Here's a sample piece. For example, hardwood is likely to splinter on the outcut. The way to rectify that, as mentioned earlier, is to have a backup board immediately behind the piece of wood that you're trenching. It'll be a sacrificial board, you'll cut into it, but at least it'll save the workpiece from splintering. And secondly, don't try to go down too deeply. Uh, if you want to make a, a trench this deep, make it in three or four steps. Do it incrementally and uh, your cutters will last longer, the wood will be less likely to, be, to creep out sideways and you'll end up with a better job. Don't be overly concerned about the slight beard that routing can throw up in hardwood. This is unavoidable, but it very easily sands off. When using the router upside down in the shaper mode, the direction of rotation of the cutter is absolutely critical. Until you become more familiar with the machine, I suggest it's a good idea to put a couple of arrowheads on your Triton table to show you which way the cutter turns. Just mark them on there and they'll, they'll serve as a reminder to you. It's very important that you always feed against the direction of rotation of the cutter, never with it. Let me illustrate what I mean. If you wanted to take a piece of wood like this and dress a small amount off this outside face, it would be very dangerous to pass the wood between the, the fence and the router cutter like this because you'd be feeding with the direction of rotation of the cutter. The cutter would climb up on the work and rip the piece of wood out of your hands at a very high speed. There's a way to do it and you'll see that in a few moments. Generally speaking, you should always try to keep the router cutter concealed within the two fences, between the two fences, so that you're prevented from straying onto the wrong side of the cutter and you'll always be feeding against the direction of rotation of the cutter. If, for example, you wanted to do a trench within the body of the wood, or a groove rather, then you can lower the router cutter like that. And then you can pass the wood through because there is no chance of that cutter flexing aside. It's completely buried within the piece of wood, and then you can pass the wood largely between the cutter, the, the cutter and the fence. Let's say you want to do an edge rebate right there on the edge of a piece of wood. Okay, set your fences in until the router cutter is substantially nestling between them, and then by turning the cutter around and getting the maximum arc of the cutter, you can touch that to your pencil line there, and you can raise and lower your router cutter suitably to the correct height and then you're almost ready to go. Always fit the safety guard where possible. If the router this just tilts up when, you're, uh, when you push the wood underneath. Don't trail your fingers behind the workpiece. It's a very common cause of injury. Keep your hands clearly in view and above the work. Make sure the fence is nice and tight. You must always use the fence when using the router upside down because otherwise you just cannot get a straight line.
Uh, always use a fence, make sure it's tight, but it doesn't always have to be exactly parallel. Here's an important distinction uh, between the router use and the saw table use. Because the router is effectively a point cutting source and the saw blade is a disc, you're no longer required to keep the router fence exactly parallel. If the model router table you have has calibration scales on it, then use the scales as a reference point only, but you don't have to be too worried whether they read the same in both windows. As long as at the point where you're comparing the cut of the wood, it looks correct. Lower the safety guard, keep the hands firmly on top of the work, switch on and make the cut. The feed rate is very important when using the router. You shouldn't go too fast, nor should you go too slow. If you've got any burn marks along the work, you're probably going too slowly. If you've got a lot of splintering and tearing, you're probably going too quickly. You'll have to experiment with different cutters and different materials. The hole in the router table is left quite large, so you can use fairly large diameter bits. Uh, but when you're using a smaller bit, it's a very good idea to adjust the fences inwards. If you've got this model router table, make yourself up two wooden sub-fences that you can screw on and adjust them in so just a bare minimum of cutter is showing. If you've got an older model router table, the fences are themselves adjustable. But lock those fences in position, and then you can adjust your cutter to the right depth of the material you'll be planing. And that is so that the cutter only just protrudes through, through the material. Now you can remove your workpiece, take a straight edge, and move the rear router fence in line with the maximum arc of the cutter. So turn the cutter by hand until this tooth is closest to you. Put your straight edge in and adjust the rear fence until the straight edge is just touching the fence and the cutter when it's swinging around. And turn it by hand like so. Now you have to set a differential between your front and rear fence. Uh, very simply, use the calibration scale stamped in the front fence. They're two millimeters apart. Just try or lock that. Now, take a straight edge and just double check that the gap you've got in there is exactly parallel all the way. Tiny bit of increase there. Okay, now that gap represents the amount you will plane off with each pass. As you can probably imagine, the setup we've got here now resembles a giant planer on its side. Uh, with a front shoe, a rear shoe, a gap between them, and the cutter buried quite between the two shoes. Uh, now, incidentally, you cannot fit a power plane at the work center or at the router table. Um, there are too many difficulties in mounting it and guarding it. You can get equally good results or better results, in fact, using a cutter this way or using a saw blade. Now, turning out the planing job I want to do, for example, a piece of veneered particle board often has a shattered edge left by the saw blade. Set up like this, I can very easily plane that edge off, fit the safety guard, keep fingers well clear, keep the hands on top of the work and press the work down onto the table. Not too hard, but firmly. Switch on and make the cut. That's now left a perfectly smooth edge, and I've taken off the amount representing the, the, represented by the differential between the fences. As you can see from this sample piece, the rear fence acts as a catcher once the workpiece has passed the router cutter. Um, you may want to file a chamfer onto the leading edge of the rear sub-fence to make sure you don't get hung up on this point as you're passing the cutter. Now, that's quite straightforward when you're cutting all the way through a workpiece. What happens if you wanted to machine a wide face and you needed to do it in two passes, well, then you have a different setup. Firstly, you set the two fences dead in line. Set them up so that they're exactly in line with the straight edge again, 
and then move the whole fence back until the amount you want to plane off is represented by the gap between the, a straight edge and the two fences, just like that. Make sure that gap's fairly even, and that's how much you'll pass off, plane off in the first pass only. You can often fit the safety guard. You may have to give it a bit of a leading bit of a hand to start, but then you can run the piece of work through like this. Now, for doing the second pass, we'll be removing the small piece of wood in there, which is actually your support surface against the fences. You must set up the rear fence as a catcher. Adjust the whole fence until you can just turn the cutter, and it's just touching the straight edge. Fine, lock that in position. And now, set a differential in your front fence so that you're removing just the right amount of wood. Here we are. Make sure the front fence is parallel, check on the calibration scales, fit the safety guard, and you're ready for the second cut. And the rear face in that instance acted as a catcher, and you can do the cut easily and effortlessly. When making mortise and tenon joints, you'll save yourself a lot of effort if you make the mortises first with a single pass of your outer, and then make your tenons to suit. Very simply, all you do is attach a long, straight, high extension fence to your outer fences. That'll give you good vert vertical support, because to make the mortises, you must plunge the work onto the bit. For a trial, get an off-cut of the material you'll be using, set the router cutter just protruding above the table, just a little way up will do, and by eyeballing from above, adjust the fence in or out until the router cutter is exactly central on the end grain of the piece of wood. Now that looks fine from here. You can now do a test cut, pull back, switch on and plunge the wood onto the, onto the cutter. <laughs> And now you can check either by eye or with a ruler that that dimension and that dimension are equal. Adjust the fence if not until you've got a perfectly central mortise. The next trick is to determine the length of the mortise and the starting and finishing point. I find it very helpful to do this. Take a square, turn the router to its maximum arc position, just like that, and make a pencil or pen mark on the table and do the same at the other end of the cutter. So you have to find the limits of the cutter itself on your work table. Then, let's say you want to make a mortise to suit a tenon of approximately these dimensions. That measurement there from the edge is 10 millimetres, OK? Make another mark, 10 mil from the forward line, and that's your starting point. Now, determine how long a mortise you want. In this case, this is 50 mil. Now, deduct the diameter of the cutter from that 50 mil. So 50 less 13 is 37. Make another mark 37 millimetres further along on the table. Don't make the mistake of adding in the cutter diameter twice, because it makes a hole and then makes a slot as well. So deduct the cutter diameter from the length of mortise. And then, very simply, you can attach your stop blocks. For setting the stop blocks, firstly, lower your router cutter. Get it down below table level. Place your wood against this line here. That's your starting point. Clamp a stop lock on the back. G-clamp that in position. Now move the workpiece forward to the front line. Without bumping the workpiece, clamp another piece on. Another stop lock. Now here's a hint. Don't have your stop blocks coming all the way down to table level because sawdust could pack up in there and give you a false reading. Give the sawdust a bit of escape underneath, front and back. Blocks are set, you're almost ready to go. Raise the router cutter a small amount. 
don't be too ambitious. Don't try to go in too deeply. If you try to make a deep mortise in one pass, you'll splinter the workpiece, you'll damage your outer cutter, and you'll make a, have a really hard time. So raise the cutter just a small amount, have the wood firmly against the back block, angle it up, rehearse the cut if you wish, and switch on and make the first cut. That's actually a perfect fit, but if it wasn't, it could reset the blocks and then go through and start making that a bit deeper. Now, as I said, you do it in a series of passes, and this is a good way of seeing how deep you're going. Just sit it back up and raise the cutter until you've got, say, another five mil of lift there. Now, clearly, when you're making mortars and tenon joints, you're not just doing one of them. You might be doing eight, for example. So don't keep going up and down, up and down with your router cutter. Do all eight pieces at each of your router cutter settings. One last point on mortars and tenoning. Don't go to all the effort of chiseling those mortars a square. It's unnecessary. It's much easier to round the tenons off, much easier to do that with a rasp, and then your mortars and tenon joints should fit absolutely perfectly. I mentioned during the section on bevel ripping that you can get excellent results with a 45 degree router cutter like this one. To use it, you have the fences dead in line, so get a straight edge and set them up. And slightly more than half of the router cutter must be buried behind the fences, with less than half of it forward of the fences. But have a look at what happens if I try to use this maximum cut and try to put a 45 degree bevel on this piece of hardwood in one pass. It's doing the job okay, but I'm overloading the router. You could hear the motor protesting. I'm overloading the cutter and splintering the wood. The way to do this is again in a series of bites. Move the fence in closer to you and take off a small pass. That's given a perfect face, and now move the fence out a little bit, do another pass, and out again if necessary for the final pass. Working along or against the grain with the shape a bit is normally quite okay, although you will get some splintering perhaps if you take, try to take too much off. But working across the grain, you're almost certain to get some splintering unless you take some precautions. Now you may want to consider at all times for the cross grain work, convert back to your saw table, put your circular saw in with the blade angled at 45 degrees in a cross cut mode and cut them off with your saw. But if you want to use a router, here's how you should do it. Take the piece of wood that you'll be routing. Certainly do this in several shallow bites rather than one big deep bite. And use a pusher piece, a pusher block, a piece of scrap directly behind the workpiece. So that A, it helps you propel that along square against the fence and B, it protects this back edge for the breakout when the router comes through that back edge. This is all you do. Take another bite. Because of the loss of support when your workpiece is directly opposite the cutter, have these two sub-fences adjusted in as close as possible, but still allowing the router cutter to spin. As I mentioned earlier, there's a huge range of router cutters available, shaper cutters, with a ball bearing on top or a high-speed steel pilot. Now that acts as your fence, so you don't really need to use the fence on the, on the Triton, but you should anyway, for safety reasons. Very simply put, the fence will prevent you from going onto the wrong side of the cutter because if you feed the wood on this side of the cutter, 
you'll be feeding with the direction of rotation, the cutter will dig in and rip the piece of wood out of your hands, making it a projectile, and your hand could graze the cutter on the way through. So wherever possible, especially on straight pieces, have the fences in, have them a little bit back away from the high-speed steel pilot, just slightly behind it, and lock the fence in position. Then you can fit the safety guard. You'll still be able to use the ball bearing as your guide, but uh, the fence is there to stop you from going too far onto the wrong side. Then put your wood in and very simply make a cut. If you find the material splintering during a full cut, or if the router is labouring or the router a bit smoking, for example, then use the fences and move it in for a partial cut. Do one cut at that setting, move the fence out a little bit, do another pass, and the final pass you can actually be riding on the pilot wheel. You can even shape quite small pieces, provided you hold them very firmly and move decisively. Always move against the direction of rotation with the cutter, never with it, always against. Now, it's a good idea with a small piece like this to rehearse the cut. Place the guard in position, push it through and determine where your hands are going to be. Make sure your fingers are well out of range of the cutter and just run through all four faces if that's what you're doing. Now, it helps often, because of the breakout problem I mentioned earlier, to do the cross-grain work first and then go with the grain because then when you do the shaping along the grain, you'll disguise any breakout you may have had with the cross-grain work. So do them first and do it again in a series of bites. Don't be too ambitious. Don't try to go in too deep first off. You'll find the cross-grain work might not be right on the first pass, but when you get it closer to the pilot, then you'll be just fine. A lot of people ask us whether you can make your own moulding on the Triton Work Centre. Well, certainly, provided you've got the router table and the appropriate router cutters. Safety warning, though, moulding invariably is on a thin, flimsy piece of wood, and there's no room on that piece of wood for you to hang onto it and feed it through and have quite a substantial amount machined off it. What do you do? We'll start off with a larger piece of wood than you need, wider, and then you can run it through like so. And then if you wish, you can turn it around and run it through again, so you've moulded both edges of that piece of wood. And keep doing that until you've got enough piece of moulding. And then take your router off, put your saw back on, convert to table saw mode, and rip yourself off the two pieces of moulding that you want. Let's say you're trying to make something like this plaque. Now this has external curves, they're no problem. You can use the fences and the, and the safety guard. It also has internal curves, now they are a problem. This piece illustrates it more clearly. Quite clearly with the fence in position, you just can't get into this area here because you're hung up on these points. So on these rare occasions, what you should do is move your fence out, not use it. Instead, use the pilot in its normal mode of operation. You'll have to hold the wood very firmly and let's say you want the, the shaping to run from this point to this point only. Well, you'll have to plunge in at this point so that this point on the workpiece uh, approaches a pilot at the point closest to you. Hold it firmly and resist any temptation for the, pilot, for the router cutter to push you back this way. This way you'll be going in the same direction as the router cutter and that's dangerous, so hold it very firmly, especially for the plunge in. <laughs> 
you've got a half inch capacity router and you've bought some very large router cutters which are too big to fit through the hole in the Triton table, there is a solution. Make yourself up a false top out of particle board or hardboard, no more than a half inch thick. Cut yourself a big enough hole using a hole saw to admit the cutter and then you can use it as normal and still use the fences and the safety guard provided you make your board small enough to fit just between the two locking clamps. I hope you've learnt a lot during the course of this video and that you too will become one of the tens of thousands of Triton owners who have got one of these machines, uses it properly and raves about it because of its incredible versatility and accuracy. A couple of quick points before finishing. Firstly, fill in and send back your warranty registration certificate as soon as possible. There's no point hanging on to it in the hope of extending your warranty period. We do have records of serial numbers and the approximate date they were sold. So fill it in, give us some information about yourself and what you want to do on the Triton, and we will tailor our manufacturing processes to suit that as much as possible. Filling in the warranty coupon automatically gets you on our mailing list for details of new accessories and new products as they come out. We've just recently appointed an aftermarket manager whose job it is to look after you, Triton owners, and all of your particular needs in woodworking. For example, we're currently working on the project book, which is due out later in 1987, and we've got plans well in hand for a Triton Owners Club, which may take a year or two to get off the ground, but when it does come, I think you'll be delighted to be a member of it. Finally, we hope you're delighted with your Triton Work Centre, and if you are, why not share the good news with your friends? They might want to buy a Triton themselves. If you're not delighted, if you've got a problem, then please let us know about it, otherwise we can't help you. Contact us direct or contact us through your local agent. Happy